then uh, next, this afternoon, we have uh, a keynote uh, feature by Professor Speck, who I will introduce uh, shortly. And then immediately following, that would also include a question and answer. And then immediately following that, we have our second panel. Um, and that is at two o'clock. At three o'clock, we'll take a coffee break. Um, and then we come back for uh, another panel, another talk and panel. Okay. So I uh, hope you enjoyed lunch. Um, I think this is my first sort of in-person uh, workshop, you know, in a couple of years. So I certainly enjoyed seeing human beings uh, and sitting outside. Um, I'm Zubeda Unais, and it's uh, really my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Tomasz Speck, who is joining us from Hawaii, everybody. He is in Honolulu. He's at a conference, uh, and he kindly accepted our invitation to give this talk, which uh, I was very excited about because he is um, at LiveMaths, which is the sister center to uh, LIMC2. Uh, at University of Freiburg. So he is at the Living Materials Center at University of Freiburg, which is connected to the Living Materials Center here at Penn State. And he's a, been a great uh, member of our partnership. And uh, as you'll see, um, he does really uh, uh, awesome uh, research that uh, will touch on bio-based materials as well as fungi. Uh, so Professor Speck is a professor uh, of botany uh, functional Morphology and Biomimetics, uh, and he's also the director of the Botanic Garden, and hopefully he'll talk about that. It's a really um, uh, uh, interesting place at University of Freiburg. He uh, is the spokesperson, too, for LiveMats, as I mentioned, the Cluster of Excellence in Living Adaptive and Energy Autonomous Material System. Uh, he's the director of the Botanic Garden, as I mentioned. He studied biology of the, at the University of Freiburg and received uh, the 1996 uh, Venia Legendi for Botany and Biophysics. From 2002 until 2006, he was Associate Professor for Botany, and uh, in 2006, he became full professor in Botany, uh, what I mentioned, Functional Morphology and Biomimetics at Freiburg. He has received a long list of scientific awards and that I, I cannot possibly uh, do justice in my short time introducing him. I'll mention that he is editor and co-editor of several scientific books and journals. He has published more than 300 peer-reviewed scientific articles. And his main area of research uh, is in biomimetics, functional morphology, and biomimetics of uh, biomechanics of plants and evolutionary biology. So without any further ado, Professor Speck, Uh, Tomas, we can't hear you, even though we had done a test and, and that worked just a few minutes ago. Oh, he, you're still uh, muted, Tomas. Ah, uh, now I'm unmuted, hopefully. Can you hear me? We can hear you now. Ah, great. Hi. So hi to everybody in Aloha from Honolulu, as Subeda said, where I'm uh, joining CMRS conference. Thank you, Subeda, for your kind introduction. And uh, yes, uh, from the Botanic Garden, I will show quite a few examples because a lot of our role models come from the Botanic Garden. And today I will speak about plants and fungi as models and building material for bio-inspired architecture and soft machine. Oops, no, I hope now my... Yes, now it runs. So Beta already said that I have several hats on and I want to dive it, directly dive into what my interest in research is. So my main interest in research, as Beta said, is learning from nature. And biomimetics is typically subdivided in seven different bigger fields. What you see popping up, these are biomimetic products which made it on the market and one normally discerns lightweight materials and constructions, surfaces, interfaces, fluid dynamics, motion and processes, biomechatronics, robotics, communication, sensorics, optimization, architecture and design. In my institute, we mainly concentrate on lightweight construction materials, surfaces and interfaces, more and more also on motion processes I show and the application of these results for architecture design, but also more and more for soft robots and soft machines. We started a couple of years ago 
to use bio-based materials. And I have to say that bio-based materials are not directly linked to biomimetics. You can do biomimetics without any bio-based materials, but I think it's a real good kind of combin combination if you use bio-based materials, which have a relatively high sustainability value in your biomimetic research. I will say some words at the very end of my presentation. Perhaps a few words how we do biomimetics, how we do our work. Normally, we start with something which can be called technical biology. This means a quantitative analysis of biological structures and functions with methods from engineering, sciences, chemistry, and physics. With this, we try to understand the form, structure, function relationship of our biological role models. Having this improved understanding of the biological structures and function, we do what is normally seen as a typical biomimetic process. We try to successfully implement the functional principles and develop innovative technical products inspired by nature. Here one has to say is that it's always a kind of re a, a, a new invention of materials and structures inspired by nature. It's never ever a copy, a copy never works. What's interesting for us, normally you, you scale up or you scale down, use totally different materials. If you don't, base, if you don't use bio-based materials and we do a lot of simulations. And this helps us to understand form structure function relationships and equipped with this, we can go back in a field which is called reverse biomimetics for a better understanding of our biological role models. And with this improved understanding, we can develop improved biomimetic products. That's the end. It's called a heuristic spiral, which connects technical biology, biomimetics, and reverse biomimetics, and shows continuous increase in knowledge in biomimetics and biology. One has to say is that for some applications, we collaborate a lot with big industry we have to go beyond biology, either by combining several biological role models to make a successful biomimetic product, or even to add functions which do not exist in nature. And this is important because I think that doing biomimetics is one thing, but on the other hand, we have to really force to get more biomimetic products on the market. Having said this, very quickly, what's biomimetics in different fields? I would like to say a few words why I think that plant inspired and also fungus inspired architecture is really worth doing. And also a few words on the importance of biomimetic, of biodiversity. Then I will give some examples from all plant inspired multiple systems, which we use for facade shading systems and adaptive building hulls. Then one of our new, let me say, yeah, pet results, I always have my pet results where I say, good God, I like the most. And this is a Liftmatz Pavilion, which is bio-based and is bio-inspired and shows nicely how one can combine both approaches. And then a few slides on uh, bio-based material systems where we used mycelium as stabilizing materials, so fungus-based materials. And at the end, one last slide on biomedics, past, present, and future, some ideas. So why plant-inspired and fungus-inspired architecture. If you look at this graph, we see that about 64% in a conventional construction goes into the construction itself and also into construction maintenance. So nearly two thirds of the energy materials is, is used during, product, during construction and construction maintenance. And it's a real challenge because if you look at the uh, footprints, we see that constructing buildings uses about 40% of the resources, 40% of the energy and generate about 50% of waste. So it's really worth to have a look, what can we do to build greener buildings? And this really shows the importance for sustainable architecture in the 21st century. I have to say is that everything we do in architecture, we do in close collaboration with our sister excellence cluster, INT-CDC in Stuttgart, which is headed by Achim Menges and Jan Knibbers, with whom we collaborate since many, many years. A few words also to biodiversity. The number of species doesn't matter. This is the numbers I have given here are reasonable numbers. So around 7 million animals, 
0.6 million fungi and lichen species, 0.5 million plants and algae, and around 2 million bacteria and cyanobacteria. The numbers depend on a species concept. But anyways, let's have a look at these 10 millions. And if you keep in mind that perhaps 10,000, perhaps 12,000 are looked at what they can do as inspiration for bio-inspired materials and how we can use them as bio-based materials, then you see that there's a real treasure trough, which we just have to use in future research for a more sustainable kind of technology and kind of architecture in future. And I think what's also important, there is no biomimetic projects, no products without basic research as well in biology, material and engineering sciences, because this basic research renders really the basis for the development of bio-inspired materials with custom tailored functions and the same holds for bio-based materials. Now let's start with plant-inspired motile systems, which we use as inspiration for facade shading systems and adaptive building hulls. First, let's have a look what is different in technical and biological motion principles. What you see here, these are typical motile systems from the technology realm. And their movement and motion in these technical devices is characterized by a separation of the actuating propelling parts from the moved respectively moving body. You always have rigid structures which are driven typically by rotating wheels in the propelling parts. This holds for cars, for uh, um, uh, uh, airplane engines, for trains. The only exceptions are rockets which work with thrust, but in all the others you have rotating wheels. And interestingly, you find no rotating wheels with an axis in nature. The only exception may be the bacterium flagella, but this is a special case. So it's really a very special technological development. If you look at nature, here you see a running uh, 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 flying birds, you see opening of, uh, of flowers, running cheetahs, you see uh, liana, how they try to find the support. And as you see, movement and motion in plant and animal kingdom is characterized by a deep integration of the actual in propelling parts and the moved body. So you can't discern what is a moved body and what is a propelling part. It's really deeply integrated and they all show generally embedded elasticity of motion. What's interesting, if you normally think on motion, you think on animals, you nearly never think on plants. And this, I want to explain why this is the case. One reason is, as you see here in this running cheetah, that in animals, the visible changes in position or stature is typically taking place in a time scale between tens of seconds and several seconds. And these time scales make them easily recognizable for our optical system. And the reason is an evolutionary reason. We have been either hunters or prey for animals. And that's where we have to see animals moving, even if they attack us or if they want to hunt them down. Another interesting aspect is if you look at vertebrates, but also at insects or crustaceans, there are differences, for example, Elastic movement exists also in animals, like in snails or octopus, but vertebrates and insects, for example, all have a specific setup in their motion. But it's not explains this in a running cheetah. So movement in vertebrates is based on a complex interplay of actuators, muscles, which are linked by tendons to stiff members, bones, and they are interconnected to localized hinges, joints with gliding parts. So this is the same in our body. And this is interesting that this causes consequences. You always have stress concentrations in the localized joints. You have heat production and wear due to friction in the joints. And that for these localized joints are prone to wear fatigue and failure. And this is different in plants. And let's have a look first why we overlook typically motion in plants and what's different in plant motion. So this is a picture of a tropical lowland rainforest in French Guiana, where I worked a lot with my French colleagues. It looks relatively busy, but it doesn't look motile. And the reason is that visible changes in posture or stature during plant motion typically are either very slow, they are taking place in time scale between minutes, hours, days, or weeks. These are cross processes, or they are very fast and happen within milliseconds. I will show you these are, for example, capturing processes in carnivorous plants. And both make them hard to impossible to be recognized by our optical system. So that we don't see plant movements is a consequence of our optical system and is the evolution of our optical system. 
Let's have a look here. These are time lag movies. Here we have a growing part in the tropical rainforest from BBC Wildlife, which is really nice. It takes place in weeks, months, or years. This is from our own research, search of of lianas, hours or days before attachment is found. And even the opening of a pine cone scale, which takes place in minutes or hours, is not visualized as a motion. On the other hand, we have the very fast motile systems in plants. And this is, for example, high speed motion in carnivorous plants. Here you see the uh, Venus flytrap, which traps its prey within 100 milliseconds. Uh, Drosula glandarifala, which has this catapulting mechanism. Altravanda, another. Uh, <clears throat> Underwater, this is underwater sister species to Venus flytrap, which captures within 70 milliseconds. Even much faster is the bladderverse, which sucks in its prey in 0.5 milliseconds. And the fastest movements in plants are the openings and spore discharge, which takes place in 20 milliseconds. In addition to the different time scales of plant motion, the NASA thing, all these motions show an elastic deformation. In none of these motions, you have localized joints. You always have distributed areas where the motion takes place. And therefore, without joints, you have no stress concentration. You have no concentrations of wear and fatigue. And this is very interesting for concept we apply in uh, building hulls and uh, other uh, applications. Let's give me two examples, which you may know as they have been done in the last 10, 12 years, together with our colleagues from the architects uh, in Stuttgart. These are Flectofin and Flectofold, two bio-inspired facade shading system. One reason for doing this was we wanted to find hingeless kinematic systems, which are no rolling joints or moving or gliding joints involved. Here you see a nice building, Pieken Kloppenburg in Cologne by Renzo Piano and Knibersen Helbig, who did the uh, engineering part. And it has an inner shading. Don't ask me, inner shadings are always not good. So it keeps light out and heat in. But anyway, they have an inner shading. And you have these rolling systems. And you have several thousands of these small rolls. And a lot of these rolls always block. And this is no good because you have to maintain them. You have to exchange them. It costs. It's time expensive and cost expensive. And our idea was find solutions for adaptive hingeless deployable planner systems for facade shading and building hulls. And the first example, we looked at the bird of paradise flower which I see just outside in the garden of the hotel where I'm in. It's from South Africa originally, and it's pollinated by birds, either by sunbirds or by weaver birds. And if the birds land on this <coughs> violet perch, then the perch bends down. I show you a movie in a second. The perch you can imagine like a cylinder, which is open on top. It's formed from two petals. And by the weight of the bird, it bends down and opens. And this is a motion process which is called torsional buckling. Normally, engineers hate torsional buckling because it's a way how thin shells fail. But nature has functionalized torsional buckling. And I show you the movie now. When the bird lands on it, it buckles. And then it's opening. And here you see the pollen. And the pollen can be placed on the feet of the bird. And if the bird visits the next plant, pollination takes place. And interestingly, you can open and close this perch, which is a membrane thickness of 10 microns. And you can open and close it over 3,000 times with exactly the same force to, uh, to displacement curve without any fatigue, without any wear. And this was our basic idea. So we want to build something which only closes and opens with bending. And what we did then, we did FEM analysis with our colleagues in Stuttgart. We had the first function model. And it consists at the end of a backbone, which you see here. This is more or less a rod. And on this rod, there is a membrane. And if you bend the rod, the membrane flips aside. And this you see down here in this first demonstrator, what looks like if you would turn these flectofin elements, it's just by bending the backbone. This is about 2.5 meter high. And if you bend the backbone by this hydraulic piston on the base, then you bend it by about three, two to three centimeter in the center, and then it's closing. And if we remove the bending, if you straighten it again, it's opening. So you have no gliding parts in. 
And this is really interesting. Then we developed a double flector fin where you have one backbone with two wings and we patented it and already in a year of patenting a very similar system exactly with the same basic uh, torsional buckling principle was built by colleagues in South Korea in a, a, a <clears throat> kinematic pavilion and they were up to 14 meters high and they work perfectly and this is another point, say really transports the aesthetics of the biological role models. They look beautiful. The architect said, this is building is breathing in air. For us, it was great, a great success, but we are not so entirely happy at the end because we have geometrical restrictions. That it functions, the elements have to be at least seven times longer than wide. And for this huge flectofin elements, you need quite a bit of hydraulic power at the base. So it shows the beauty of the biological role model, but the actuation is at the end brute force hydraulics, and you have these kind of, uh, of geometric uh, restrictions. And therefore we looked at another example, and this other example is the water trap. The water trap is a sister group of the Venus fly trap, which lives underwater and catches small um, Pulex, a small, a small of these uh, crustaceans, but it has a totally different motion principles than the Venus flytrap. The Venus flytrap makes a curvature inversion. So if you look from the outside, it's convex, a uh, concave at the beginning, and then if it's triggered, it makes a curvature inver inversion in concave and it closes. And it is only two stable states open or closed. And this is different in the, in the water trap because what the water trap does, it bends a big, the backbone, the backbone here, this is a midrib of the leaf. The entire, uh, entire trap consists of two halves of a leaf. And this is a midrib and the midrib bends a tiny bit. You see it better in the simple FEM simulation. And by this tiny bending, we have something which is called motion amplification. A tiny motion, a tiny bending, causes a huge motion of the two halves of the trap and closes it. And it's even faster than the fly trap and interesting for application, you can stop it at each situation. So you can stop it continuously. And this is what you need for a facade shading system. Another nice aspect is you can build it in square in different dimensions and you can cover without a, a, a hole each concave and convex surfaces on buildings, which is really really interesting. What we did, we converted this rod-like backbone into a lens-shaped one, because this was easier for actuating with these curved lines, which you see here, these curved folds, which actuate at the end our flectofin, a flectofold uh, facade shading system. You see some simulations. You can play around with the curvature. For example, here we have a, a smaller curvature, then here you have a higher curvature. If you have a smaller curvature, if you look here, you need less pressure, but you have a higher hinge stress and so on. You can adjust it exactly to the aims, to the needs you have. This flat fold uh, elements are simply made with the thing which is called vacuum sack method. They consist of a uh, glass fiber reinforced polymer an elastomer and two PVC layers as a kind of auto coating to protect them against UV and also to make them look more nicely. And it can be done in one process. And in the stiff parts, these are the wings and the central end shape stuff. You have a lot of glass fiber reinforced polymer. And in the flexible parts, this is mainly these curved folds. You have nearly only elastomer. It looked pretty nice. It worked pretty nicely. We had one problem after several hundred motion cycles the curved folds showed fissures. And this is no good because for an application architecture, the opening should be at least 15, 20,000 times possible without any uh, failure. And for that, we had to optimize our curved folds. And this we did together with colleagues from Tübingen who are specialists in wing folding and unfolding. And if you look at the hind wings here, for example, of uh, Italian buck, the Crophosoma italicum, they fold and unfold the hind wings several thousand times in their lifetime, and you never see a failure in the hind wings. And if you look here, then you see that these kind of folds are specially built. They have a kind of bulging structure, which is slightly omega shaped. And including this in our flector, uh, flector fold, we could 
reach opening cycles up to 10, 15, 20,000 times. And here you see one of the first demonstrators. Here you see the curved folds. And it's simply actuated here at the back by a pneumatic cushion, where you need very little overpressure around 10 to 20 millibars. So it's much closer to what we find in nature by the hydraulic uh, actuation of the turgor. And as I said, you can cover all clinal and anticlinal surfaces uh, on buildings, which is really nice. Here you see a demonstrator of 36 of these flector folds. You can actuate each flector fold separately. You can actuate them in groups. And it really looks nice. This is from the back where you see the actuation. And this is from the front and really looks like it's very, very aesthetic in my opinion. And it really transports again the aesthetics of the movement of the biological role model. What we do at the moment, this is what was planned to build some of these tent-like structures in hot areas in the Arabic Peninsula. It was all blocked because of Corona. And at the moment we built an, uh, a kind of demonstrator uh, building at our greenhouses where we will shade part of it with a flecto fold shading system, part with a flecto fin, and the roof is a conventional non-motile facade shading system. And we will measure how much better we hope or how good our system competes with the traditional non-motile systems. There was one problem in, and you can imagine if you look at this actuation here, we have a cushion which is pneumatically actuated. And if a hole comes in, it would not work any longer. Okay, we have developed self-sealing foams, coatings for these kind of pneumatic elements, but this would make them relatively expensive. And that's what we looked at as a solution. And this solution was made in the uh, group of my wife. And she looked at something which you perhaps also have seen in your gardens. Some of the grasses are open, have open leaves during the day and close the leaves overnight and open them again over the day for better for the synthesis and for protection, they close them in the night. And this is brought about by so-called bulliform cells. These are simple cells. If you see here, you see groups, typically six to 10 of these bulliform cells. And each bulliform cell, which you see here, has stiffened walls at the sides and at the base, here stiffened, here, here, and here, but the top wall is not stiffened. And if you inflate them by turga, by the internal turga pressure of the cells, which is around one to two bars, then they inflate and they open on top because the top layer is flexible where the side layers and base layers are stiff. And by this opening, they put pressure on the side and that the leaves open if there is turga, turga in these bulliform cells and they close if there are reduced turga in these cells. And this has done again in collaboration with our colleagues from Stuttgart with an FEM analysis and we made a very simple 3D printed uh, <clears throat> model. You have here stiff walls and you have flexible walls here at the hinges here, at the center here, at the hinges here, at the hinges here and here. And if you inflate them, then the side walls go to the outside and the upper wall goes up exactly like in the bulliform cells. And if you combine several of these elements and inflate them, then they bend up. And if you deflate them, they go down. And with this, we had a cellular actuator for our flector fold. This is less prone to failure because if one, two, or three of these elements, if you use, as in this example, eight elements, it still works perfectly. And with this actuator, we can lift easily masses up to 500 grams. The next two examples are examples which I like at the moment also very much. These are hygroscopically actuated building hulls, which are inspired either by pine cone scales or by silver sizzle bracts. This is a pine cone scale, a pine cone opening where the scales are open if it's dry and they close if it's wet. You all know this. The reason is biologically the pine cone seeds are airborne, they are small like helicopter seeds, like Samara seeds, and they only can fly if it's dry. And the pine cone scales you can visualize as B layers. They have a kind of uh, a resistance layer on top with fibers and an activating layer with uh, scleroid cells on a base. And if the scleroid cells swell, if it's wet, so they close the pine cone scale. If they shrink, they open it. In reality, we have just published papers on that. It's more complicated. It's a hierarchically structured system. You have Inside these kind of fibrous structures, which themselves act as B layers, but 
for what's important for us, think that one of these scales is a B layer, opening if it's dry, closing if it's wet. And what we are interested in is more or less how does nature for the printing. We want to understand the form structure function relationship of these pine cone scales in detail. For this, we made high resolution micro CT analysis where we could exactly see what's going on with the different kind of uh, uh, tissues in the scale, how they deflect, how they stretch and how they expand during the motion principle. We did also this kind of Aramis analysis, where you can exactly say where the motion takes place in the scale and which kind of strains exist in the X and in the Y direction. So we really wanted to understand exactly what's going on in these scales. Why are hygroscopic actuated systems so interesting for applications, especially also in uh, architecture? The reason is that hygroscopic plant structures harvest energy from the environment, so they have no metabolic energy consumption. All the energy, which means dry air, wet air, is given by the sun. They are highly integrated functional structural systems. There is sensor, actor, reactive motor element and support structure in one material system, and they display an extraordinary high function resilience and robustness. And the latter we could prove, I started my scientific life many, many, many years ago doing biophysics of fossil plants. And from that time, we still have a collection of fossil plants. And we looked at fossil scale, at fossil cones. This is a Catellaria cone, which is re uh, related to pine cone. And it's between 16.5 and 11.5 million years old from the middle Miocene. And this is a Immune interglacial fossil pine cone, which is about 110 to 125,000 years old. And we tested them here in the dry state and here in the wet state. And you see that the angular change of the single scales show exactly the same pattern as does the extant living penis sylvestris scales. And this shows us that even after 15 million years, these systems work. They still do their trick. First, it proves that there is definitely no living element involved. And secondly, they show how robust and resilient the systems are. OK, the angles you can get in the fossil parts are not as high as in the living ones. And the reason is simple. These are charcoalified elements. And during charcoalifying process, minerals are embedded in the, in the scales, which block partly the motion ability and such where we don't have the uh, uh, exact the same angular change, but the motion pattern is exactly the same. And this proves really that they have a high resilience and robustness. What did we do then? We did 4D print for uh, <clears throat> 4D printing. So we wanted to make a mechanically robust, functionally integrated, environmentally responsive system, which could show multi-phase motion without consumption of external energy. And for this, we used a kind of supporting structure. These are the white elements. This is ABS plastic, simple ABS plastic. And the actuating system here in brown, this is a copolymer with cellulose microfibrils in, which swell if it's wet and shrink if it's dry. They can print these arrangements in totally different arrangements. And this was done by a former postdoc of Achim Menges, who has now a professorship uh, for architecture. And what you see here, it works. It works perfectly. This is natural pine cone scale of Penis Valachiana. And you see, it's not only bending, it shows a two phase motion. Because if you look in detail, if it's closed, it's V shaped now, it's stabilized. And before it can bend down, it has to flatten, and then it can bend down. And exactly this two phase motion by V-shaped flattening bending down, we can reproduce by our printed artificial pine cone scale. What we also want to do is this is a running uh, ongoing project. We want to analyze and reproduce orchestration of these pine cone scales so that they don't interlock and don't lock in the pine cone if they open. This is very interesting, and it's as I said, an ongoing project. Where do we want to do this for? If you look at state-of-the-art convertible roof structures and skin for climate control in buildings, this is Wembley Stadium, which I like very much, but the roof construction, in my opinion, is totally technically overcharged. It uses a high energy, energy consumption is absolutely high. It has high cost for construction maintenance, and it often lacks robustness. And our idea is that we make a smart building skin with our flaps, and we want to combine two motion principles. One is the motion principle I've shown you, 
open if it's dry, ventilation takes place, closed if it's wet, rain is kept out. But in addition, we want to add another type of motion so that these flaps go with the sunlight and shade according to the uh, vector of the incoming sun. And this is what we're at the moment working at. The next example, second one for high cross skip actuation. This you probably know, this is a silver thistle. And the silver thistle is not a flower, it's a flower head. You have here many, many tiny flowers in the center. And at the outside, these silvery parts are the so-called bracts. And these bracts close and protect the flower head if it's wet, and they open if it's dry. And this shows a relatively complex three-phase motion. I'll show you here in a time-lapse movie. First, it bends outwards in two minutes, then it stretches in about 10 minutes, and then it bends inwards and protects in about 15 to 20 minutes. It's a complex motion principle, a motion sequence, which is caused by one and the, always the same stimulus. So we have no different stimuli, so it, it's becoming wet, wet, and wetter. It's always the same stimulus of humidity, and by a structural adjustment in this tiny, tiny structure. It shows this complex three-phase motion. And this we're interested in to yeah, reproduce in a 4D printed structure. So what we did first, we did some analysis and what we could prove, okay, this is very nice. So that's a relative angle of this leaf. Here you see how we measured the relative angle of these bracts. This goes more or less linear with the humidity, which is very nice for technical application. What's even more important in my opinion is that they have a kind of, uh, that they have a kind of uh, phase before it starts. This is the angle in blue, and this is a mass. And the mass is a measure for the drying out. And you see that the motion doesn't start before the mass is gone down to about 62%. So you have a kind of period where nothing happens. So up to 35, 38% of the humidity can evaporate before the motion starts. And this is very important for technical application because if you would have a system which acts, which reacts to changes in 1% humidity, you would always have this wiggling which you don't want. And so you say you have a kind of starting phase and only if the humidity has dropped by 30 to 40% then the motion starts. And all this is embedded in these tiny structures. This is an, uh, an SEM of the cross section of one of these leaves. This is an SEM of the longitudinal section. And you see it consists out of about 20 cells. You have layers which are totally different. You have a totally blocking layer at the top where no water can go through. You have easy accessible layers on the base where water is really more or less sucked in. And you have different layers in the center which are delaying water access. So you have T three types of layers, blocking layers, and restrictive layers, blocking layers which allow water but with a time delay, and actuating layers which allow immediate water access. And this we used as a concept generators, again, in collaboration with our colleagues from, uh, from uh, Stuttgart. And the idea was we wanted to make a program of time scale by bio-inspired 4D printed materials. We can vary the thickness of the actuating layers by just printing several actuating layers. We can vary the porosity of the mesostructures of the actuating layers. And by this makes them not only more lightweight, but also allow easier access of water. And we can partly block the water access from the surface or entirely block it. And by doing this, we had a structure which looks like that. Here we have at this example four actuating layers, one restricting layer and one blocking layer. And by printing this, we can orchestrate a motion sequence. So the mesostructure of this hygroscopic material consists of functional multilayers, which have an anisotropy in water permeability. And this allows us to orchestrate the motion of a system like silver sizzle did. And at the end, we built a very simple soft machine by this approach. And the soft machine should do the following. You have here a strip of 4D printed material with a hole on top and you have two lashes on the base. And the idea is that the basal part of this strip remains more or less here, this part here, remains more or less straight. 
if humidity is, 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 is given, this is a dry state and humidity, this part remains more or less state. This part curls in and curls it in a way that the opening goes over the two lashes. And then with a given time delay, the two lashes bend outwards and lock it. So you have a self-locking mechanism with a three-phase motion, exactly as we have seen in the, uh, <clears throat> in the um, uh, silver sizzle brackets. And I show you a motion, I hope it works. It's always a bit, you see how it bends. This remains straight, it bends, it goes over the lashes and then the lashes go outward and lock it. So we have one stimulus, exactly the same stimulus, but we have orchestration of motions. And this is a very simple soft machine and the application field is wide. One example uh, shown by our colleagues from Stuttgart is for example, in this hyperscopic uh, kind of uh, opening systems. And here you have one without sequential opening pattern. So the different parts of this kind of uh, structure, uh, don't know what's going on, let's go back again. So they could interlock because they all open at the same time. But if you have a sequential lock locking uh, mechanism inspired, oops, inspired by the practice, uh, I have to start it again, sorry, uh, problems with the movies. And if you have a sequential opening, which you see down here, then you see that the outer three open first and then the inner three open. So you have no interlocking, you have no interference. And this is orchestration we want to build and which we have shown that it's possible in one material system by a clever arrangement of the different layers. And I think this opens a real wide field of application. Before I go to the mycelium and fungus uh, uh, stabilized materials, last example, no motion, but bio-based materials involved. And this is our LIFMAT pavilion we have built last summer. So the basic idea is what can we learn from nature for ultra lightweight structures and how can we transport it into a new kind of architecture by bio using bio-based material. So our role models are arboreal cacti like saguaro cactus from the, uh, from the Sonora desert or cylindropunciaes or prickly pears. So it's, they do not look very lightweight, but if you look at the inside, at the wood structure, you see it's a reticulated wood structure where very little wood is used in between these wood parts, water can be stored. And you have here in the saguaro cactus, you see nicely this reticulating patras. And this is ultra lightweight and at the same time, very, very mechanical stable. And this was our basic idea. How can we use this for a new kind of bio-based building? To understand what's exactly going on with the different analysis, we made, for example, micro CT analysis. Here you see micro CT analysis of branching of one of these columnar cacti. And you see nicely not only the reticulated arrangement of the wood fibers, but also how the flange mount. You see here the main stem is very interesting, but we could do the same even with living material systems. This was in collaboration with uh, Linea Hesse. We did MRT. MRI structures, we could see exactly how the side branches of Nupuncia are built. And again, we could nicely see the reticulated structures. Having this in mind, the question is, how do we transfer it to a technical application? In biology, this reticulated structure is built by intergrowth of individual wood structures of wood elements. But intergrowth is very hard to do technologically. So we have abstract the biological model and translate it into a technical feasible mode of production. One idea would be you could, uh, you, you could braid it, but braiding huge structures as we have to use in architecture is time expensive and cost expensive. So the colleagues from Stuttgart decided to do a thing which is called coreless winding. And the coreless winding is done instead of intergrowth and it produces crossling lightweight materials for architecture. And here you see exactly, this is, I show a bit more in detail, our Lifmat pavilion. And this is made out of flex fibers with some sisal cords in. And these flex fibers are soaked in a, in, in a resin. And by coreless winding, you could exactly reproduce the arrangement of these reticulate structures we have from our saguaro wood and make an ultra lightweight 
bio-based structure and it's totally re recyclable. You have these, uh, you have these uh, flex fibers, the size ports and the covering is made out of uh, polycarbonate, which can be ground down and remelted. So you have a much better life cycle assessment. The only problem I have to assess, uh, say we still have is the resin. We used a conventional resin, which is not as good. At the moment, we are together with colleagues trying to develop a lignin-based resin since the, every, since the entire thing would be totally, uh, uh, totally recyclable. Here you see all is done by computer controlled Man, uh, controlled planning by digital planning. All plans are done in a computer, and then you have a kind of uh, computer controlled uh, manufacturing. Is this called as winding, which is done by these KUKA robots? You see here the fibers of the flags, and you see here how the KUKA robots do in Stuttgart in the Technicum. Uh, see kind of call as winding. And finally, the elements were done by a small company, which was based by uh, former students from Stuttgart. And it not only is very quick, it's also very nicely. And I hope I can convince you to have a look here. You see here, this is a, a link where you see a lot of movies on this pavilion. We won already several prizes, the Green Concept Awards, material prize. And you see it looks beautiful and really transport the idea of lightweight construction, the idea of beauty, and also the full recyclability which we wanted to have in this pavilion. And you see here a small movie, how it's built up. It's built up in several days. It weights, the so single elements weight, these elements weight about 150 kilograms, are easy to construct. And I think this is a way how construction should be thought, combining bio-inspiration with bio-based materials. Last but not least, mycelium stabilizing materials. This goes back to a project I had together with colleagues in, uh, in Vienna, in Austria, and this research project was called Growing as Building, and was funded by the Austrian Science Fund and located at the University of Applied Sciences and Applied Arts in Vienna, and coordination was done by Barbara Imhoff and Petra Gruber. You can get this book for free via <coughs> ResearchGate. Just send, ask for ResearchGate, and I send you an electronic version of this book where all the data I show you are in. We have two projects where we were involved. One project was on slime molds. The idea was slime molds more or less, yeah, fill 3D layers of complex structures and systems. And see slime molds, uh, we are, it was very hard for us colleagues who worked on a slime molds to really find out where the slime molds at the end have grown at. And this was a collaboration again with Linnea Hesse, where Linnea used her MRI, MRI uh, um, uh, methods to analyze in detail the three-dimensional arrangement of the slime molds after a given period. I don't want to go into detail here because slime molds are no fungi. They are totally own class of, 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 of beings, but they are typically treated with fungi, except for I mentioned it here. Where we are in were mycelium stabilized paper stroke grain material systems. And the basic idea is how good are these systems and how mechanically stable are they? At the end, the preparation was done of a paper straw rye grain mixture as a food matrix for oyster mushrooms, Prorotus austriatus, and they were grown for three weeks in darkness at 17 degrees. You see here the ingredients of the food mixture, and then you see the paper straw rye grain mixture, which was sterilized first, and then the mycelium was they were more or less uh, infested by the mycelium, and then finally the mycelium grows all very well through three-dimensionally three -dimensionally through this uh, food matrix. And some of these uh, structures even uh, built here fruiting bodies. And you see here how these structures look like. Here you have the uh, food, uh, here you have the, uh, the food uh, matrix, and here you have the fungi mycelium growing. And it's really a full intergrowth, a three-dimensional connection in this kind of matrix. What we did then, we let these things grow in samples without compression. Cylindrical samples, which were originally 80 millimeters long and 32 millimeters wide. We cut them into halves. And then we tested them mechanically. Before testing, and I think this is important, 
be killed the fungus by putting it into an oven at around 80 to 120 degrees so that the fungus is dead. And then we tested it in a dry condition and we did first quasi state compression tests. You see the setup, a load cell, compression punch, sample camera, and control unit, just a simple, yeah, it's an instron or whatever you use for that. And it's interesting, you see here uh, single pictures of the compression. And you see at the end it fails. And if you look at the data, then it's really interesting. You see first, it can be compressed tremendously. It can be compressed nearly by 70%. A strain of 0.7 is, is relatively huge. You see, you have two linear parts, which we call linear part one, modulus for elasticity one, and then it's compacting. So it's strain stiffening, compression strain stiffening. And then you have a linear part two where we can calculate the modulus of elasticity two. And the modulus of elasticity one is between 1.7 to 2.7 megapascal. The modulus of elasticity two between 0.4 to 0.6 gigapascal. And if you compare it, for example, to particle board, then this is a modulus of elasticity, which is about 10% of particle board, of a typical particle board, and then is about a third of particle board. So it's not so bad. Even more impressive is a compressive failure. The so compressive strength was between five and seven megapascal, and this falls into the range of conventional particle boards, which range between five uh, for compressive strengths between five and 20 megapascal. What we see is strain stiffening which is interesting, and a high energy input before failure because you have this drastic deformation, which is, feasible, which is possible before it finally fails. What we also did, we did dynamic impact compression tests with a compression impactor with 3.8 joule. So you see the impactor falls down to the sample. We measure exactly what's going on. We have force transduction and how the compaction takes part. And if you look here, we find also very nice results. So we see here the force, we have compressive free failure events. So it shows a drastically benign factor beha failure behavior. It doesn't fail by one go. It stabilizes again, stabilizes again, stabilizes again, stabilizes again. These are milliseconds. And what's also very important, you see this huge energy dissipation. So a benign failure behavior under compression and under uh, impact and a huge energy dissipation. And I think this makes this material it's really interesting for applications. And the idea, the colleagues said, these were architectural design concepts. This was really built. This is a mycelium fungus stabilized shell part, a part of a bio-based roof. You can really more or less print or arrange the matrix where the fungus should grow in in the way you want to have it. And then you can let the fungus grow in. And then at the end, you have to yeah, kill the fungus in one way or the other. But then you have a fungus mycelium stabilized structure. And I think we didn't go on with this research because at that time, I was not so very much interested in bio-based materials. We have now started another project where we use um, where you use glue, which is produced by genetically manipulated uh, bacteria to glue together wood particles. So maybe perhaps in a collaboration with you guys, we could go back to some of uh, these mycelium stabilized uh, things, which I think are really interesting from the mechanical uh, behavior. And with this, I'm at the end. I just want to say a last slide with some ideas on biomimetics, but also on bio-based materials. Let's start with bi biomimetics. I think 40 years ago, nearly everything you could think, but nothing could be done. It was not technologically realizable. Today, we can do it. And there are three reasons, in my opinion, that we have a realistic and historical chance to do it first. We have a drastic advancement in analysis, simulation, and production technologies. You see, we use micro CT, we use MRI, we use also electron microscopy, we use uh, 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 <clears throat> small angle diffraction, and so on. What's more important, all the simulation technologies exist. 
can simulate stuff, can simulate it to understand what we do and how the products are. And we can produce it for the first time from small to big for reasonable prices. And what's also important, and there come bio-based materials in, there is a change in the political and social environment, the acceptance of sustainability. But one has to say biomimetic materials are not per se sustainable. You have to test it for each biomimetic material, for each biomimetic product, individually the sustainability because sustainability is no biological concept it's a man-made concept and this is part of what we are doing in LIFMATS and part of the hopefully ongoing collaboration with LIMC2 and with this I'm at the end I want to thank all my group who has done all this wonderful work which I could present all of our funding agencies and if you want to make a virtual tour through an exhibition we did together with our colleagues in Stuttgart it's still online you see it here and type it in and have an online tour and with this I'm at the end and I want to stop with a saying of, uh, of Leonardo da Vinci is that human's creative con genius is capable of making various inventions, but he or she will never be able to make one being more beautiful, being more economic or more straightforward than the ones of nature, as in nature's inventions, nothing is missing and nothing is superfluous. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tomas. That was uh, a lot of food for thought and a lot of <laughs> really interesting demonstrations of um, plant as models and as uh, uh, building materials. Um, we can take one, one burning question and then we're going to move right into the panel where we can definitely take more questions for Tomas at that point. Uh, is there a burning question on Zoom or one here uh, in person? Putting you on the spot, right? It has to be burning. <laughs> Anything on Zoom? Yeah. Shirley, I'm coming to you. Yeah, thank you for that very interesting talk. I am curious about whether whether your group has been thinking about um, these kinds of building materials in weightlessness. And the reason that I ask this is because a lot of times people are thinking about how would we build in space? How would we build on planets with different gravity? And so I'm just curious whether that's some of the discussion that you all have been having. We had a discussion because one of our colleagues in, uh, in Vienna, she was especially interested in space buildings. Um, I think biomimetic buildings you can do in space, but as soon as you involve, for example, growing fungi, growing mycelium, I have, I have to say, I have no idea how they grow in zero gravity. I have no idea. I know that roots do funny things in zero gravity, say, because they are uh, gravitropistic uh, gravi growing, but I think for the materials themselves, there should be no problem to put them together also in zero gravity or on foreign planets. But as soon as you involve living beings, uh, zero gravity definitely plays a role. I have also no idea how a Venus flytrap would function. I think a Venus flytrap probably would function normally because it has no gravitational uh, stimulus. But I, I actually, I, I don't know how the living parts would work in zero gravity. The rest, Biomimetics, I think it doesn't matter if it's zero gravity or even higher gravity if you look at the static uh, of your buildings. Yeah, I think some of these materials have been tested um, on the space lab. Um, I know that our spawn lab has sent materials to space. And so I'm sure that if, if somebody was really interested, there's some data about growing many different kinds of materials. Uh, I, I have to admit, I want to sort the problems on our planet first before I go to space. No, I, I have to admit, I never thought really about it. And I know from a colleague who had a project on a, 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 a couple of years ago on growing roots of peas, and the roots of peas make a total mess in zero gravity. I think, I think we're going to take that as the, the last word for this session. Roots of peas make a mess in, in <laughs> gravity. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you for your question. And yeah, let's thank Tamash again. <laughs>